I'm going to be talking about how you can use uh, electronic data collection methods to collect data in very resource poor settings in developing countries. Okay? So over the past, I guess, 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of uh, new data collection exercises going on in developing countries um, and a lot of re researchers collecting data themselves. And this is driven in part by a demand for evaluation of interventions and, and different policies in developing countries. But at the same time, unlike the UK or the US or European countries, you generally don't tend to have good household surveys or um, you don't tend to have very good um, data of the populations of interest. So as researchers, we need to go and collect data ourselves. And often in these countries, um, we find that we don't even have um, any reliable survey collection companies, which, uh, which means that we do end up going to do it ourselves. So there's a desire to collect high quality data, but at low cost. And uh, the primary method that's been used in developing countries has generally been using paper and pen. But over the past few years, there have been growing interest and efforts in using electronic methods to collect data. And today I'm going to talk about what the possibilities are and things you need to think of when considering uh, electronic devices. I'll talk mainly about PDAs, but there are other options as well, which I'll highlight to collect data. And I'll also draw on our experience uh, collecting or implementing a ha large household survey in rural Malawi. Okay. So just a quick roadmap. I'll talk about the possibilities, what considerations you should make, how these compare with paper-based surveys, and um, spend, try to spend some time on, on um, our experience. Okay, so what are the possibilities? So electronic methods, they allow for the collection of much the same uh, information as a paper and pen-based survey. And on top of that, you can collect actually more information. So you can use, um, GI you can capture GIS coordinates, for instance. You could use, uh, you could include questions which have photographs or videos in them. You could but they also provide a, a way of collecting information on that's quite sensitive. So you could have, um, you could collect data on, for instance, sexual partners of, uh, of rural villages by um, using laptops where people just listen to some of the questions being said and mark the answer as without anyone else knowing uh, what they've put in. Um, you can include inbuilt consistency checks. So as you go through a questionnaire, as the interviewer goes through the questionnaire, if there's some incorrect answer or inf unfeasible answer put in, it uh, shouts out a warning. And you could also allow for the questionnaire to be routed automatically, which saves a lot of time and um, hassle. So possible devices. They're PDAs or smartphones now. Uh, laptops or netbooks, the small ones, um, and tablet PCs, which I guess are becoming cheaper and cheaper now. So what considerations to make when thinking of devices? A lot of things. Um, cost, so how costly is it? How easy is it to carry around? How long does the battery last? Because depending on how long your questionnaire is, you want to make sure that um, the, uh, you don't need to charge it every two hours. What are the field conditions like? Is it very hot, dusty? Is the equipment going to be uh, going to last or not? How large is the screen? So how many questions can you see? Um, can you back up data that you store? That or can you back up the questionnaires? How would you transfer the data? Um, safety and security, I'm thinking, we've been thinking of safety 
of the interviewers themselves. So in many resource poor settings, you'd think that if someone's going around with a PDA, he's a big target for theft. Um, and also in the device itself, could you capture, you know, does it have a GPS receiver that automatically captures GIS coordinates? Does it have a camera that could be used to take photos that you can use as additional data, really? Can you record voice recordings, that kind of thing? There are lots and lots of software options available now. Um, so I've just named a few here that I'm aware of, but there are lots more. I think if you do a Google search, they come up. Um, but things to think of and things that we didn't, uh, I think uh, some things we learned about as we went along. You want to make sure that the company you choose has offers good support in case you run into problems. Um, how expensive is it? How easy is it to use? Because there are software that you have to hard program yourself versus some where you just have a drop down menu and you can very easily create questions. Does it allow for different scripts? And I think the hardest ones are usually for, for Indian languages. So does the software support um, script for Hindi, for instance? Um, how complex ro um, routing or types of questions can you program? Is it possible to consult a database? So is it possible to load a database into the device that automatically then just brings up, OK, this is, we interviewed this person last year, and this is the person you need to interview this year? Um, does it capture your GPS information? And what format do you want your data in? Okay. So then once you've collected data, how, or once the interviewers have collected data, how, how to take it to the office next? Or how do you get it to your office or, um, or your, to your own computer? So one possible way is you get uh, some other, so you could get supervisors or other staff members who have small laptops. They load the data from these PDAs onto the laptops in the field, and then you aggregate them in some centralized server. And this is ideal in, in large geographic areas, and, or rather in areas that are very remote and don't have um, good connectivity. The other option is uh, using a mobile phone network. This is not possible in remote areas, such as the one we were, we were working in Malawi, and um, it's quite difficult to get a mobile phone signal, let alone transmit data. But this is, it, it's been improving a lot, though. Um, so I think uh, in the future, it might be much easier to transmit data in this way. Um, and in some cases, you could also have some automatic transmission of data via, again, a mobile phone network to a centralized on online data survey. So in developing country settings, this, these two generally become um, impossible to work with. So you, you, you end up having to use, um, I guess, laptops to transmit data. So something to cons well, something I would actually recommend if you're thinking of using electronic devices or PDAs. Get some software that will lock down everything other than the applications needed for your data collection. Um, it helps reduce misuse, improves efficiency, reduces um, your battery life, uh, so increases battery life. And at the same time, if it's stolen, it makes it very, very le it makes less, it less attractive. Okay. So n data handling when using electronic data methods is very, very important because all your data will be in soft format. You don't have um, questionnaires that you could look up if something happens to the uh, computer files. So it's very, very crucial that you back it up. You can back up on, I would recommend backing up both on the PDA before the data is transferred 
and also your online server or laptops or whatever else you're using. And you should ensure that whatever software you use allows for backing up of data and train your field staff on the importance of backing it up. Okay. So how do they compare with uh, paper-based surveys? First, they're much, much more environmentally friendly. You don't need to print as many questionnaires, so you don't have these kinds of huge boxes of paper that you need to travel, transport all around. At the same time, the data, data is entered by the interviewer directly, so, the, so you cut out this step of data entry. So that reduces costs as well. You don't need to worry about the, um, understanding someone else's handwriting. Interviews can be faster with the automatic routing. Um, valid answers only are allowed and that generally, the, idea, the sense is that, or I'd like to think you end up with better quality data as well. And this has been confirmed by uh, a paper in the Journal of Development Economics, which compared collection of data on food consumption using both paper methods and, and computer-aided <coughs> methods. And I think they found that paper methods actually under underestimate the amount of, uh, amount of food that households actually consume by something like 15%, so, which is quite big when you're thinking of, so consumption, food consumption in particular plays a big role in thinking of poverty lines in developing countries. So underestimating in this case uh, has big, big consequences. So the, oh, as far as I can think, the main drawback of, electron of um, electronic methods is your data is all in soft format. So you need to, you don't have any hard copies available. You could lose data if the, there are some viruses or if, the, if a PDA is lost or stolen. Okay. So I'll now spend the rest of the time on talking about how, uh, about our experience in Malawi. So for those of you who don't know, Malawi is a poor rural country, uh, well, mostly rural country in Southern Africa. It's uh, between Tanzania, Mozambique, and Zambia. The survey I'll talk about was conducted in the Mchinji district, which is in the central region of Malawi on the border with uh, Zambia and Mozambique. The, this area is, is quite poor. Its socioeconomic conditions are similar or worse than for the average for Malawi. So, oops, sorry. So only um, literacy rates are about 60%. Only 10% of households have access to piped water and 2% to electricity. Infrastructure in the district as a whole is very, very poor. There are only about two or three tarmac roads in the whole district. And um, as I'd mentioned before, only 2% of households had access to electricity. So just to show you, this is where Mchinji district is, and this is Malawi. It's a very, very uh, long country. And just a few pictures on conditions there. The survey we conducted was uh, in collaboration with a, a health NGO called Maimona. They, they have implemented two health interventions uh, focusing on maternal health and uh, infant health. And we, were, we wanted to collect data to evaluate the economic effects of these interventions. We interviewed uh, three, almost three and a half thousand households in two rounds. The first round hap happened in um, November 2008 to March 2009, and the second round from October 2009 to January, uh, February 2010. 
the survey itself was a very extensive socioeconomic questionnaire. So we had uh, one component, which was an individual questionnaire, which asked roughly about 150 questions on different uh, dimensions of um, on things like education, work, self-reported health for each household member. There's a household questionnaire which included something like about 350 questions on consumption, savings, assets, adverse events, um, family networks, and so on. The, on top of that, there was a questionnaire that was respond that we. Um, that was answered by a, the main respondent, who was a woman between aged 15 to 40. And that included a, questions on family planning and health knowledge. And we'd also collected some measurements, so anthropometric measurements, height and weight of children under the age of six. So the questions in general, there were think there were some which were open-ended. There were some, most were quantitative. There were some qualitative questions as well, some categorical. By categorical, I mean you need to pick uh, out of a bunch of options, you pick more than one. And sorry, so out of a bunch of options, you pick one. And you had some, we, there were also some multiple response questions. So out of a, a bunch of options, you pick more than one. And we had um, some pretty, some complex skipping patterns. And these depended on answers to questions, previous questions, or even the age of the individual and the gender as well. So we had, uh, we used PDAs to collect data. And we had uh, 24 interviewers who were each given a PDA. There were three supervisors, each of whom uh, was in charge of one third of the district. And each was given a laptop. We had a coordinator who managed the data collection and the central data server, amongst other things. So the MyMana project handled the fieldwork and related training oh, and logis logistics. So in terms of equipment, we used um, some HP IPAC uh, PDAs. I think there might be better ones in, in market now. The reasons we used this were first, there's no mobile phone capability. So we were trying our very best to make the devices as unattractive as possible to theft. At the same time, it had a large battery, so it could last an entire day without being charged. And um, it also had a good screen size. So just, so this is the screen and, so this is the device we used. Okay. So we used uh, the software we used is called Entryware, and you get uh, one. Um, the, there's the end, it consists of the of a designer, where you design your question, you get the questionnaire, and you manage your data, and uh, some and a mobile version for use on the PDAs. So this is what a question would. Uh, this is how a question would appear on the on the PDA. We had uh, this kiosk program we talked about that locks down the PDA. We also used uh, an external GPS unit to try and collect GIS information. And uh, because electricity is not very available in these areas, we provided um, the interviewers with a portable solar panel and a battery that would store the solar charge. Um, So this is just uh, an interview in action. So the, P the uh, interviewers were also given small bags to carry around the equipment to make sure it doesn't break, um, to ensure its safety. In terms of implementation, we had an excellent local partner. They provided us with a lot of advice and, and local knowledge. They helped us hire and train interviewers. The interviewers were, try, uh, were hired. Um, so something to note in, in this region, in Malawi in general, uh, literacy rates are very low. 
and it's very, very, and actually people are not very computer literate. We had hired um, interviewers who had completed secondary school, but they had almost no computer experience. That, um, and also they had some limited survey experience. So even though the interviewers had no IT knowledge whatsoever, their uh, mobile phones have become very, very popular all across Africa. And uh, using a PDA was not too different from using a mobile, and they just needed to, to be trained a little bit on, on how to do it. So they picked up the use of PDAs without too many problems. At the same time, I think we were very lucky that we had a coordinator who was very, uh, in the first wave at least, who was, who was very computer literate, while in the second wave we had someone who, who had experience already because he was a supervisor in the first wave. So we had, um, how did it work in, in practice? Well, we had an initial learning period in the first uh, wave where we discovered that our portable solar panels didn't work at all. Um, but luckily enough, uh, there, the big boom in mobile phones in rural areas of, in, of rural Malawi meant that there are lots of uh, innovative ways of collecting, of, of charging your, your mobile phone or device available. So some people, they use, there are people who use um, car batteries to provide electricity, and there are others who have much, much larger solar panels than the ones we provided our interviewers with. Um, so they, they could use that to, collect, to charge the devices. We had we'd anticipated a lot of technical issues with the equipment, but we, did, we didn't have very many. So I think out of, out of 24 PDAs, only three failed over the two years of data collection. We didn't, we didn't experience any thefts during the data collection. Ironically, we experienced a bit of, we experienced theft after the data had been collected. Um, We'd, use the, we'd try to use an external GPS receiver to collect GIS data, but this didn't work very well. I think the interviewers found it quite difficult to use the software itself or to get a signal. So if you're thinking of collecting GIS data in developing countries, I'd recommend using a standalone GPS unit. So the nice things were actually the data arrived very quickly once the survey started. So about every two weeks, we would receive data from the field that, did, that had already been entered. And we could um, check the quality, make changes as we went along. Or uh, if interviewers needed to be retrained on something, they could be trained on um, as we went along. And we could uh, collect, we could correct any minor errors in the questionnaire without having to reprint everything, which is a pain. So inter if interviewer training turned out to be very important for getting there. We had a, about two or three intensive, uh, sorry, two or three weeks of intensive training in both waves, along with some extensive piloting. And this helped iron out a lot of issues. During the training, we first inter introduced the questionnaire before allowing them to practice on the PDAs themselves. And we checked the nice, because we were collecting data on PDAs, when we were piloting as well, within about half an hour of the pilot ending, I had the data on a laptop and I could check to make sure that everything was being answered correctly or there were no, if there were any problems, we could resolved them before the, the big data collection exercise started. And uh, the supervisors and the coordinators also held these monthly meetings where any retraining or any issues were brought up and resolved as well. So in general, the interviewers were very happy with the use of PDAs. They felt that they were seen as being quite smart. Um, and respondents were actually more interested in the survey and 
they, they didn't feel threatened by the, by the PDAs. The interviewers themselves didn't feel threatened physically because they were carrying around um, this equipment. And they appreciated learning a new technology, which they feel would be, would be important for future job prospects as well. Something they commented on was that there's no need to carry around a large number of papers, so they also enjoyed that aspect. Interviews also were much shorter. They took less time than a paper-based interview, and um, this is noticed by interviewers themselves. And um, something else the interviewers mentioned was that uh, an in so the, a, a woman or a household that was being interviewed was more was less likely to um, to see, to stop the interview halfway if, if because she thought that. Oh, she couldn't see how long, how many more questions that were, there were to be answered, so she was more likely to continue with the interview than if, uh, if it had been a paper-based questionnaire. So like our, inter our survey was quite long, um, but if anything, we think that the use of PDAs actually increased the, the response rate, not just because they were curious about that technology, but also because um, they weren't discouraged by um, the length of the questionnaire or the perceived length of the questionnaire. <laughs> um, in terms of quality, the data is of generally good quality. There were very few invalid responses in, and so that meant that really cut out a lot of data cleaning time. The interview length seems reasonable, so just, uh, just over an hour. But there are some issues that we became aware of only as we went along that we need to, if, if anyone's considering this, should be aware of as well. So the, uh, the software we used, um, to enter numbers, you needed to use this inbuilt touchpad. And that was um, quite, it, couldn't be, it can be quite tricky to use. So you could end up with uh, incorrect numbers. So for some important variables, you for instance, identifiers, you want to include um, double entry. Because of the automatic routing, routing has, on the one hand, the big advantage of, of uh, making your, the, you know, of making sure that the right questions are answered. But at the same time, if there was an error made in answering any of the questions on which the automatic routing is based, you could end up in a very different part of the questionnaire. So what we found helped was if the interviewers were given a paper version of the questionnaire, they could follow it and um, identify or understand, OK, yes, here, I'm in the wrong part of the questionnaire, so I must have made an error, and go back and make sure they end up in the right part of the questionnaire. Finally, if you're collecting a um, generally household survey, start with a roster. And then you, you ask questions on each person in the roster. So with such roster questions, it can be difficult for interviewers to keep track of who they've uh, noted down in the roster. But, um, there's a, but the software itself that we used actually helped us get around it. You could automate it so that each person's name comes up as needs to be. OK, so I'm going to conclude. So even in such poor resource um, constraint settings, it is feasible to use uh, electronic data collection methods. And what's more, they can actually work quite well. In this presentation, I've uh, summarized some of the available options and highlighted some of the practical considerations you need to make if you're thinking of using such methods. And um, I've also, I also reported from my experience in, in Malawi. Um, just a few acknowledgements. We were very, very grateful to the staff at Maimona, without whose uh, advice and support this would not have been possible at all. Um, in particular, we're indebted to Tambo uh, Sipiri, who is the head of Maimona. Um, and thanks to our survey coordinators and supervisors and interviewers. We had a very able research assistant who helped set up all this stuff on the ground and get it going.